Celebrating Junior Bowling. Elevating Junior Bowlers. This is Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Episode 103, The Season 4 Kickoff. Live on tape from Bolero Roswell in Roswell, Georgia. This is Coach Randy with the call of today's exciting action on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, where all nine kids in the field will appear on the show today. They've bowled a two-game qualifier. The top four have already advanced to the stepladder. They are, in the fourth position, Gavin Murray of Orlando, Florida. He and his brother are both here today. The number three qualifier, Bolin Nolan Kemp of Roswell, Georgia. Nolan flirted with the lead early before falling back slightly, but he looks ready to win today. The number two qualifier, Hunter Moffat of Roswell, Georgia, bowled his first day of league today as a member of the Roswell Varsity. There's no handicap today. He's going to have to bring it against the big kids from here on out. And the tournament leader, Annalise O'Brien of Ballground, Georgia. Now the two-time defending national champion among U15 girls at Junior Gold. Annalise overtook Hunter in the second game of qualifying to get into the top spot today. Now the fifth spot in the stepladder will go to one of the other five players in the field, but they'll first have to survive a single ball eliminator with the other players from places five through nine. And we'll get that single ball eliminator started right now. We'll introduce the five kids as they come up. First up, and qualifying fifth, is Dylan Murray of Orlando, Florida. He and his brother came up to Bowl Prodigy as they're on their way to Tennessee, where they used to live. As I mentioned, Dylan's brother Gavin is already locked into the fourth spot in the stepladder, and Dylan would love to join him. If he can get through the single ball eliminator, it'll be just the second time we've had brothers square off against one another on Prodigy. And that's the way it's done, a strike to start. Next up is our number six qualifier, Christian Manel. Christian is one of the winningest players on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, but last season his win total dropped and he's looking to rebound this year. Christian with a new arsenal. He's back to throwing storm equipment. This is a, an Optimus that he just picked up. And he revs it up and starts with a strike. Next is our number seven qualifier, Faith Roper. Fans of Prodigy are well acquainted with Faith as she joined our program a couple of years ago and has frequently appeared on the show. She's made some improvements in her game this summer throwing it with a little bit more authority than we've seen her before. That one hooks high, and she gets seven to start. We'll see if that's going to be good enough to go on. Qualifying in the eighth position is Allison McGowan. Allison is looking to take a big step forward in 2019-20, and her game has already improved. She's been working on it all summer long. She's generating a little bit more speed now. Pulled that one slightly. Goes through the nose, gets eight, but she's safe. Bowling in the final position in the single ball eliminator is our ninth qualifier, little Josh Greenberg. Josh is looking to overperform his position in the field. He's a fiery little guy who wants it so bad he can taste it. And if he can get through the single ball eliminator today, that alone would be a huge victory. Josh may be the smallest player in the field, but he might just have the biggest heart. He's eager. A 
that hook sharply, but he gets eight, and that's enough. He's moving on. Now, before we move to frame two, I should mention that they're bowling on the Kegel sport pattern known as Sunset Strip. 40 feet in length, Sunset Strip has an overall volume of 24.7 milliliters of oil and a one to three ratio. So any errant shot isn't gonna get much help from the lane to guide it back to the pocket. You bowl a high game on this pattern and you've earned it. As you see from the score sheet, Faith was eliminated with that seven count in frame one. Back to the top of the order. Dylan crossing over, leaves the two pin. That's a nine count. Usually a nine count will be enough. In most single ball eliminators we've done. Well, Christian has new headphones, so he's in his own little world. And he's having to stand all the way in front of the ball return. And still doesn't give it enough room. That crosses over, he gets nine. So next to go will be Allison. Allison with a pretty simple game, down and in. She'll play right around the second arrow. And stuffs it. Big strike and Allison is safe and on to frame three. So it falls now to Josh. He needs nine to get into a roll off. A strike and he would be safely on to frame three. Eight or less and he'll be the one making the next exit. Mixed him up and gets nine. So we have a roll off. The nines were not safe this time. So all the nines are up. We will eliminate the low player. And if they tie for the low number once again, we'll just keep rolling off again and again until we eliminate someone. There's another nine count. So Christian, nine will at least get you into a roll off. It might get you through to frame three, depending on what Josh does. Allison will be an interested spectator, but she's safe. And the pins are already falling before Christian ever throws the ball. So we'll have a momentary delay here while he resets the rack. You just gotta go with the flow here. Might be hard to get nine shooting at it without a head pin. Encouragement from the peanut section, reminding Christian to keep the ball on the lane. He threw a couple of gutter balls earlier in the qualifying round. Oh no! A three count! And he says, toodles! Yeah, that's probably not gonna be enough. Well, you never know what you're going to get with Christian. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. Josh needs four pins to advance to frame three.
And it looks like he has his own personal photographer on hand to chronicle his every move. Oh, and there's nine. And see you later, Christian. Your day is done. So now, we move on to the third frame, back to the left lane. And back to the top of the order, Dylan. And he goes high once again and leaves the two pin. Well, nine was good enough for a roll off in the second frame. We'll see if it holds up here. Allison went high the last time she threw a shot here on lane 39. She'd like to measure this one perfectly and put it right in the pocket. But it crosses over and a little unlucky doesn't get the pin action and that's eight. So that puts Allison on the bubble. And now her fate is in Josh's hands. Josh is asking, why do I have to go last? Well, it's because he finished ninth. And we put these five players in the order that they qualified. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. As you see Josh's mom crossing the screen, she's shooting some video of her own. All right, Josh, got to get nine to be safe. And he puts it right in the pocket and gets nine, leaves the four pin, and it's going to be Dylan and Josh in the final frame of our single ball eliminator to determine which one of them is going to take that fifth spot in the step ladder today. Josh has climbed all the way to the final pairing in our single ball eliminator. But first up, it's Dylan. And he goes high once again and has left the door wide open for Josh with an eight count. So Josh just needs eight for a roll off, nine or a strike, and little Josh will be moving on to the stepladder finals today. He's a nervous little guy. He will pace. Come on, Josh, focus. He needs nine to move on. Nine or better. Oh, and he just didn't give it enough room. And it's gonna be Dylan who will move on to the stepladder finals and will get a battle of the brothers when we return after this. people on this planet. Mocha is always in your face, trying to talk about what she can do and what you can't do. Rafael is so competitive that it's very easy to push his buttons. That's the number one reason I do it. Send in the security guard. Excuse me. Stay right there. What's going on right now? I want to meet you. Okay. You're about to lose, bro. You got one 
One more. What are you gonna do about it? Share this prize with your friends? No, of course not. <laughs> Are you a professional bowler? Do you bowl? No. Just bowled a perfect game. Hey, sorry, I I was watching. He didn't actually bowl a 300. He did. I'm pretty sure I did bowl 300. No, you did not bowl a 300. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I did. I've never bowled a perfect game. I'm sorry for you. You didn't bowl a 300. I had my eye on your guy's score. You didn't bowl a 300. I'll challenge you right now. <laughs> I don't need a challenge. I don't need a challenge. I need someone to verify this for can, me. Can I get security in lane 14? Day for the past six months. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I bolt hey. constantly. Excuse me. Stay right there. What's going on right now? This guy was about to accept a $3,000 check for hey, me. Don't touch him. Touch me. Did you bowl the 300? I guess. The computer said so. <laughs> he did not bowl a 300. He did? No, I'm pretty good. You're about to steal $3,000 for something you didn't do? Wow. There's nothing worse than stealing from a bowling alley. Oh, really? I can think of a few things worse than that, but... <laughs> a lot of things. Hey, guys, I get you. Go. Hey, 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 hey. Ma'am, ma'am. Are you being for real? Because I'm, I'm being serious. Oh, my goodness. This is so my God. Earlier today, the field of nine kids bowled a two-game qualifier. After game one, it was Hunter Moffat who was in the lead, with Nolan Kemp, Annalise O'Brien, and Gavin Murray close behind. Then in game two, Annalise uncorked the highest game of qualifying with a 223 to leapfrog past Nolan and Hunter to grab the lead. Of course, only the top four were guaranteed a spot in today's step ladder, while the bottom five were thrown into the single ball eliminator that we just completed, with the survivor grabbing the fifth spot in the step ladder. And that survivor is Dylan Murray, who will now face his younger brother, Gavin, in match one of our step ladder finals today. The winner will advance to face Bolin Nolan Kemp. Then the winner of that match will bowl Hunter Moffat, and the winner of that match will be in the championship against Annalise O'Brien. In stepladder competition, you keep advancing as long as you keep winning. So here we go with match one, our first full game match of the 2019-20 season, season four of Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Our two visitors from Orlando, Florida, Dylan Murray and Gavin Murray. And if I've done my math correctly, Dylan will turn 14 later this year. And Gavin just turned 12 last month. And there's a solid strike to begin. This is gonna be lefty against righty. Dylan a smooth stroke and southpaw. And his brother Gavin, a cranker on the right. Man, that was perfect right there. All right, now Gavin. Oh, and he gets a nosedive to go. And you get a wry smile 
from Gavin, and for good reason. Watch the six pin, the second one from the right. It's going to get pushed off into the channel, and the bottom end of the six pin nudges out the 10. Unusual carry, but he'll take it. He liked that one a lot better. This time the six pin gets the 10 in a somewhat more conventional way. Watch this one. The six pin, the second one from the right. This time it'll go to the wall and come back and tomahawk out the 10. You like those. All right, Dylan. And he gets it a little high, crowding that head pin. But somehow, the 6 and 10 go. Watch his footwork playing pretty far to the left, drifts to the right. And down they go. These two starting the match hot. That one just a little wider than he wanted it. It almost got back, but it's a three pin for Dilla. And you know what? If you're going to have an errant shot, if you can get out of there with just a single pin spare, you're thankful. Oh, but not so much if you're going to miss it. Well, that's an unforced error, and now Gavin has an advantage. And he goes Brooklyn this time and gets another one. And, well, if Gavin bowled here a little more often, he'd know that lane 40 typically hooks about three more boards than lane 39. And you have to allow for it. But that's a turkey to start. He's not complaining. And he's got all the shots going today. And a big smile from Gavin this time. Once again, it's the six pin that does the damage. It'll get pushed off into the channel and it'll be standing up and it's gonna just lean into the 10. And it gives it the love tap. Thank you very much. Love it when the bowling gods smile on you. And Dylan says, I ain't relying on any bowling gods. I'm just gonna stuff one right in the pocket. This is as good as you can do it right here. Up about the sixth board, points it up about eight at the break point and 10 back. Well, that time he pointed it a little too much, pulled it, it crosses over and, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, he'll take that crossover. His brother got a couple of them so far. And this time the high hit does not go. And he leaves the 6-10. But a nice four-bagger to start. And now he just needs to cover this spare. And he has no problem with it. He's cool. These two came to bowl on our 10-pin alley episode last season. Back when they lived in Tennessee, they came down with Dylan Hubley. We had three Tennessee volunteers on the show that day. 
These two have since moved to Florida. They're now in the Orlando area and are actually on their way to Tennessee to do a little business up there with their mom. Gavin takes care of the seven pin. But now Dylan with a double working. If he can strike these next two balls, he can even this match. But the 10 pin refuses to go. That was a missed opportunity there. But he shouldn't have any problem with this. He missed a single pin spare earlier. But he takes extra care on this one. So he doesn't make a big mistake here in the sixth. This time the light hit goes as he gets the tossed salad shaker. Watch this, the head pin is gonna go to the right wall and let's count the number of pins it knocks down. I think it took out the whole right side of the rack. Oh my goodness. Well, as much crank as Gavin puts on the ball, I would never have predicted that he could leave the 4-5-7, but here's how you make it. You gotta favor the four slightly as you fit the ball between the four and the five. This, this split, you've gotta be just about as precise as any there is. And he gets a little too much of the four and gets nine out. So his lead is down to seven. And that can go away if his brother gets up and throws a strike in the eighth to get a double going. High. They're still falling. He leaves just the six. And the overhead score is wrong. So Hunter comes to our rescue to make the correction. The score you see on your screen is correct. And there's a spare by Gavin. But now Dylan with a chance to take the lead if he can strike here. And that's probably his best shot of the match. Well, that's when you want to throw it. Watch it again. About six at the arrows, points it up to about eight at the break point. When we say pointing it, we mean for a left-hander, you're laying it down left of the break point. There's another one. And so now the lead is 13. And Dylan has taken control. Watch this. He will lay the ball down to the left of where it is going to find the break point. That is called pointing the ball. Gavin a little wide with that one. Leaves the eight. Lucky he didn't have company in the form of a 2-8-10 or something. But the two went. The 10 was gone, and here's just the eight. Easy peasy. Well, 
If Gavin can strike out in the 10th, he'll shoot 222. Dylan is going at a 226 pace. He shreds the rack for his first one in the 10th. He could really use another one right here. Watch this. This ball is going to find the half pocket. Watch the five pin rip over into the seven. But he's high with the shot in the 11th. So now the best he can do is 212 with a conversion. Oh, but he runs by the three pin. And that actually could cost him. Coming down here at the end, depending on what Dylan does, with his first ball on the 10th. If he gets nine here, he wins. All right, there's eight. So he's gonna need one of these two pins to eke out a victory. A spare, of course, would be plenty. Oh, but he chops it. But that's gonna be enough. He's going to have a 212 to 211 victory, a one pin win, and it's Dylan who bests his brother, and now he's moving on to face Bolin Nolan. New excess from AMF. It will destroy your old notions of what hook and hitting power can be. What's even more exciting than bowling? League bowling. That's all America. Go for it, Eddie. We really need a strike. I love to hear that cheering. You'll hear it every week. Just join a Bowl America League. New leagues are forming now. So come to Bowl America. Yay! Where thousands cheer. Couldn't ask for a closer match as the brothers Murray battled back and forth. Gavin got off to the fast start and looked like he was going to take control. But a couple of missed spares in the second half of the match made things close. And then big brother Dylan took advantage. And in the end, it was Dylan who had just enough in the tank to eke by. So as we head to match number two, it's Dylan Murray who will face our number three qualifier, Bolin Nolan Kemp. Nolan has a few victories on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, but every one of them has come either in a team event or on a show where we had multiple winners. He's still looking for his first solo singles win, and today just might be his day. But he'll need to be on point because Dylan looked sharp for much of his first match, and now he's carrying the banner for the whole Murray family. Oh boy, but he cuts right through the heart of him and starts with a big split, the 4 7 10. Here's how you make it. You gotta fit that ball on the extreme left edge of the four pin and slide it across to get the 10. The ball will get the seven. But he just takes the count. And there's an open to start for Dylan. So now we get our first look of the 2019-20 season at Nolan Kemp, a frequent presence on Prodigy Bowlers Tour these last three seasons. 
That familiar crooked arm delivery. Not a high rev player, but he gets that ball into a nice roll at the end of the lane, and that's all you really need. Throwing it over about 12 at the arrows, out to about five at the break point. And that hyper self-fused comes roaring back. Moderate speed will give the ball an opportunity to read the lane. And he gave that one a little too much loft, which delays the hook, and the ball didn't recover. And now he's got a problem. The 2-4-10, he actually made this in qualifying earlier today. Here's how you do it. Put the ball on the left side of the two, throw that two pin over into the 10, let the ball drive on through and get the four. Seems easy enough. Not so easy when you have to do it. So they exchange opens and the count differential goes to Dylan and he now has a five pin lead. And he comes in light. That could have been a three seven. A little fortunate though, he leaves just the three. Got to be careful with single pin spares on sport shots. Nothing is a gimme. But he covers the spare and maintains that five pin cushion. It's early though. Well, in that line he's playing, it looks like Maybe he's starting to wear a little track in the lane. That ball looked like it read just fractionally earlier. And so the next time he's up on lane 39, he might want to move his feet. A half a board or a board to the right and just chase the oil line in. And he just barely gets the six pin. But it is a spare, and now Nolan up on lane 40. Well, we hardly ever talk about it, but not only does Nolan bowl with a crooked elbow, he also bowls with a crooked wrist. His hand is kind of on the top of the ball when he lets it go. Not what we would usually coach. Ideally, you want your fingers to be below the equator of the ball when you let it go. That's where the power is. But Nolan has been pretty consistent with this method. And like I said, he's not a high rev player. He doesn't rely on power. He relies on speed and accuracy. And as long as the ball gets into a good roll on the back end, well, that's all you need. Bowling ball goes through three phases down the lane. Skid, hook, and roll. Early on the lane, it's skidding through the oil, and then it starts trying to work its way back. That's the hook phase. And then it goes into a roll on the back end. And as long as it gets into a roll before it gets to the pins, you will have plenty of power. It helps to hit the pocket flush, or a little more flush than that. That was a little on the thin side. Still, he got nine and a wiggle, but the two pin remains. And now we're waiting on a bowling ball. So I think Nolan's either going to answer a couple of texts or choose a different tune from the playlist. 
Well, this gives me an opportunity to tell you that we have a very special event planned. We're going to be at Cherokee Lanes on Sunday, September 22nd, 2019, to tape a series of events. These will be Prodigy Shorts. It will be a revival of the old TV show, Make That Spare. If you never got to see Make That Spare when it was on in the early 60s, you missed something really special for bowlers who were around back in those days. It's a series of five spares with point values assigned to each one. And the pros, whoever scored the highest, would go on to shoot the sweepstakes spare for a jackpot of anywhere from $5,000 or higher, or in a different incarnation of the same show, they were bowling for a new car. Now, we're not going to be bowling for cars and cash, but we are going to be shooting for all those spares. And anybody who watched that show back in the day, I think will get a real kick out of it. And if you never saw it before, you're going to get a lot of fun from watching, we hope. So Saturday, September 22nd, we will be at Cherokee Lanes for that taping. And there's Nolan Spare at long last. The long delay didn't affect his ability to cover it. But now Dylan up on the right lane. And he gets the ripper to go. That is just about my favorite strike there is. When you hit in that swish zone, that half pocket. Now watch the five pin will whistle over into the 10. That is the quintessential power strike. And there's back-to-back -back strikes for Dylan. And with that, he extends his lead to 15. Four-step approach, very simple. Very repeatable game. I like this kid's game. Nolan would love to get a couple of strikes here and keep this match from getting out of hand. But that one goes high and he's got the 4-7. Well, the one good thing about bowling on a sports shot is that usually your opponent will not run away and hide. Usually the scoring environment is challenging enough that nobody's going to run up a big number on you. Of course, there are always exceptions to that rule. Still, we're halfway through, and the lead is 17. Well, this, our first episode of Prodigy Bowlers Tour Season 4. This show began as just a way for me to promote our youth program here at Bolero Roswell, back when it was Brunswick Zone Roswell. And much to my surprise, the show kind of took on a life of its own and now has a worldwide following, and we thank you for watching. Light. And this time he leaves a whole handful. The two, four, five, seven, eight. Well, the two, four, five, eight we call the bucket. I would call this the bucket with company. You shoot it just like the bucket, put the ball on the two and five with enough stuff on the ball to drive through and carry out that eight pin in the back. And that is perfectly done right there. That is a spare that can be missed a multitude of ways. 
but Nolan showed you a perfect conversion. All right, Dylan, working on a double. This time the seven pin stops him. Like I said, it's tough to string them when the lanes are difficult. Oh, and it's hard to maintain a big lead when you're missing single pin spares, too. So now, Dylan's lead has shrunk to just nine. Anytime the lead is within 10, most players know in match play, that can go in the blink of an eye. One double and it's gone. Or one more open and it's gone. And Dylan, a little wild with that first ball, leaves the 1 3 6. And now to make this, he'll just move his feet a few boards to the left, maybe about four or five boards to the left, throw it right over his strike target. The ball drifts over to the Brooklyn side, and that is a perfect spare. So, Bowl and Nolan will try to put together a couple of good frames here in the seventh and eighth. to get himself in position for the stretch run here. And there's a good one. Can't throw it any better than that. Four-step approach. He's a planter, not a slider. Ball out at about eight at the break point and 10 in the pit. He liked it. But now here's the critical one. If he can throw a strike here in the eighth frame, he'll take the lead. Gives it a little more loft and shreds the rack. That is clutch right there. Watch his footwork. Over about 14 at the arrows, and he hits in the swish zone and rips them apart. Oh! That looked like a pretty good ball. But this is a case of no good deed goes unpunished. Dylan with the 6-8 put the ball on the right side of the 6. Try to slide it over. He'll go all out for this. Oh, man. That was close. He loses an extra pin in count, but in that situation, I think going for it was the proper move. There are times when you're better off just taking the count, but I think Dylan going for that 6-8 a moment ago is the right thing to do. He's left a considerably more makeable spare here in the 1-3. He just converted the 136 the last time he was up on lane 39. He shouldn't have any problem with this. And he takes care of it quite nicely. But now, Dylan, down by 15, is just in a helpless position, trailing Nolan up in the ninth with a double working. 
And all Dylan can do is watch. The ebb and flow of match play. Gave it the big loft. Sometimes when you give it the big loft, you catch the fingers a little more on the upswing, and that puts a little bit more on the ball. And it looks like that's what happened there. The ball overhooked, and it goes through the nose, and now Nolan with a six pin. He goes and gets his spare ball and promptly throws it in the gutter, and that is an unforced error. And now, look at this, he's not happy. I don't blame him. He still has the lead, though, but only two pins. If Nolan can throw the first two strikes and nine on the fill, he'll shut out Dylan. But that's a pretty tall order on a tough sports shot. But he shreds the rack on the first one. And now he gives himself a chance. Watch this. Over 13, out to about six. In the half pocket and the five goes over and gets the seven. That was a well executed shot right there. But this is the critical ball of the match for Nolan. If he can strike here, he gives himself a chance to throw one ball to win the game. And right in the pocket. That is clutch. Watch the six pin. The second one from the right, it's gonna whistle around the 10, but it just ticks it on the way by, and the 10 falls inward, look at that. And now he needs nine or a strike to lock up the match and move on to match three. Eight would give Dylan a chance to punch out in the 10th for a tie. If Nolan gets seven or less, Dylan could get up and throw three strikes and win the match. He wants nine or 10 right here. And he gets them all. And Nolan wins match two. Wow. And Dylan is shell-shocked. He trips the six, and he looks around as if to say, where was that a little earlier? Could have used that. Could have used that when he left that 6-8 a while ago, that's for sure. Funny sport. Now the best he can do is 181. This time the six won't go. So a spare on the fill ball and he'll finish with 171. And he runs by, doesn't really matter. 170, the final score. It's Nolan Kemp who's going to move on to face our number two seed, Hunter Moffitt, in the semifinal next.
Now, bring the spirit of Prodigy Bowlers Tour to your bowling center with Prodigy Bowlers Tour t-shirts and sportswear, including collared shirts with the Prodigy logo printed on the back to show that you support junior bowling. Check out the entire assortment of Prodigy t-shirts in the Brownswick store. Visit ProdigyBowlersTour.com to see the selection. That's ProdigyBowlersTour.com. One of the things I always hoped Prodigy Bowlers Tour would do for these kids is instill in them an ability to perform in the clutch. And Nolan put on a clinic on pressure bowling in that match. First, when he threw strikes in the seventh and eighth frames to rally from behind and take the lead. And then again, following an errant spare attempt in the ninth, he threw three strikes in the tenth to shut out Dylan. But Dylan bowled well all day and had a chance right up until Nolan slammed the door on him. Hopefully Dylan and his brother Gavin will be back. But right now, we move on to match three of our stepladder today, as Nolan Kemp has advanced and will face our number two qualifier, Hunter Moffitt. An 18-year-old against an 11-year-old. Hardly seems like a fair fight. The 11-year-old has opted to start the match. He had the option. Oh my goodness. Well, you don't see a two-hander leave an 8-10 very often. Hunter may be a little too amped up. Kind of threw that one a little too hard. Not much you can do with this, just take one. Well, instead he gets the field goal, and that's good for eight in this particular case. So an open to begin for Hunter. Not what he had in mind. So Nolan up on the right lane. He would love to just pick up where he left off, where he struck out in the 10th in that last match. But instead, he goes through the nose, and up pops the devil. The 6-7-10. It can be made. Put the ball over on the right edge of the six pin, slide it all the way across. We haven't seen this made in a while on Prodigy. We're about due, I'd say. Oh! And that was close. He went for it boldly, but eight out, and both players with eight in the first frame, and it's almost like we get to start over. Hunter breathing a sigh of relief, that's for sure. All right, nobody draws any blood in the first frame. And that one just got away from Nolan, a little wide that time. And so he's got the one, two, four. Move your feet about four or five boards to the right. Let that ball drift over to the Brooklyn side. And you'll get the one, two, and four. And he does it well. And receives a congratulatory low five from Hunter, who's up now on lane 40. And Hunter's ball hooks through the nose. He breaks down the split that Nolan left. And he's got the 6-10 goes with his plastic ball to convert it. And takes care of it. A 
You know, when Hunter first came into our program in January of 2017, he took to this sport like a duck to water. And look at this. He knows he got away with one that time. That was a little high, but they all went down. Watch this. This is almost like a Jersey squasher. Very high hit. Got that two to come back off the wall and trip the four and seven. All right, Nolan. Lane 40. And he doesn't get the same fortuitous break on the 10 pin that Hunter did. And he leaves the 10. So he'll move to the extreme left side of the lane. Go with his plastic ball. Go straight at the 10 pin. And he missed wide right again. He did that in the ninth frame of the last match. Got away with it when he struck out in the 10th, but let's not be making a habit of that. So, advantage Hunter. Nolan will move to the left lane and try to regroup. Yikes! The washout. That was just wide from the get-go. It's the 1, 2, 8, 10. You make it by putting the ball on the left side of the head pin. Throw the 1 over into the 10. The ball will get the 2. The 2 should get the 8. If everything goes according to Hoyle. I always found Hoyle to be a lousy bowler, so you can't count on him. Doesn't get over enough, and that's another open frame. Three in four frames for Nolan, and that's not a recipe for success. So Hunter now with a strike up, a chance to open up a big lead. And he does just that. He almost looked sad for Nolan. Hunter has learned the trick about keeping his hand behind the ball. You don't see that in 11-year-olds very often. Gives him a much more controllable hook, even when it's an errant shot like this one, it doesn't get away from him. But the 10 pin rears its ugly head once again. And Hunter will go cross lane at it with a plastic ball. And that's how you make the 10 pin. All right, Nolan. This guy's bowled well all day. He had a chance to take the lead after the first game just came up a little short in the closing frame of the first qualifying game and then fell off slightly in the second game, but he's been solid all day. High. And now he's got a real cluster. The pros will tell you that next to splits and washouts, this is probably the toughest spare they face, the 3, 6, 9, 10. You gotta put the ball on the three and six with enough juice to get it to drive through and carry out the nine pin. And he didn't have that juice going. Was just a little wide with that shot, the ball deflects. And the sleeper nine remains, and that's his fourth open frame. 
in five frames. And I can assure you that's not what he was doing today, earlier. See if he can run off a little string. That looked like a pretty good shot. It just kind of didn't recover at the end. I think maybe he just didn't quite catch it at the bottom of the swing. But now he's got the two, four, five, seven, eight. We saw this spare earlier today. Converted. Oh, but this time he leaves the seven standing. And another open frame, and this is just getting out of hand. Well, now that time Hunter just got a little fast with his feet, got a little out of time. Leaves the one, three, nine, ten. This is a very tricky spare. The best way to shoot it is to throw a straight ball from the left side of the lane, let the ball deflect. That's exactly what he's trying to do. And hats off to Hunter for knowing how to play that spare. That's not one we see all that often. But he played it correctly, he just missed. But he comes back with a good shot in the seventh. The 10 just wouldn't go. It's in situations like these, you just wanna stay patient, cover your spares, make your opponent come and get you. Don't be giving them openings. Now the lead is just 28. And Nolan is a little closer to being back in this. Thanks to back-to-back -back opens by Hunter. This would be one heck of a comeback if Nolan could complete it. Pretty good shot. Week 10. He was in the pocket. I'd call that a nice commercial shot. Just didn't quite carry. And this time he gets it. When you find yourself missing to the right on right corner spares, it's usually because you've got your feet and your hips and your shoulders a little bit too open. And if you're missing left consistently, it's usually because they're not open enough. Oh my goodness. The 2 4 10, well, he's already left this once in the step ladder. He left it earlier today in qualifying. We showed this in our setup to the show today. This is what happened when he left it in qualifying. We made short work of it. He would like to do that again right now. He's almost got to to have any chance. Not to be. And Hunter with a 42 pin lead and he can just about walk this one home blindfolded. Although I don't recommend it. Oh, are you kidding? Well, that's cheating. <laughs> he knows he got away with a cheap one that time. Watch this very unusual pin action. It's the head pin. Watch the one pin, the one in front. It's gonna get caught up in the middle and then gets pushed back into the six. That's crazy. He 
He'll take it. And look at this. He's just pouring it on now. Well, like I said, an 18-year-old and an 11-year-old, it's not really a fair fight, is it? This 11-year-old is taking the 18-year-old out to the woodshed. All right, Nolan, finish strong. Through the nose, the 310 baby split. And with that, Hunter wins the match, as if there was any doubt that was coming. I think Nolan just wants to get this over with. He bowled well all day today. He just came out here and had a bad game. A little wide with the spare attempt, so... Just get your three pins, at least. You want three or four. Get four pins. You want to beat Tom Doherty's score, anyway. Tom Doherty, who once bowled an even 100 on the PBA Tour on a telecast. All right, he's at least got that beat. Another 310 baby split. Going to keep leaving this until you make it or until the game is over. Well, his game is over. Tell you what, there was a time that Nolan would be kicking trash cans over and being very mad about this, but he's pretty good-natured now. Oh my goodness, look at that four-pin move, about four inches. Nolan has really matured nicely in the last couple of years. He has become kind of a guardian angel to these young kids. That's one of the reasons he is so well behaved around them. We know that he still has a temper sometimes. There was a moment last year in league when he got the first 10 strikes in a row in a game. And then he actually struck on the 11th ball, but he fouled. And there was a trash can at the other end of the bowling center that had to pay the price for that. But that was pretty mild compared to what we'd had to deal with out of him in the past. Had a little scoring malfunction, which is understandable when he moved that four pin so far off spot, the scanner didn't know where the four pin was and gave him a strike. When in fact he got nine spare, once again the scoring you see on the screen is correct. And now Hunter with just a fill ball left. Strike here, fill it up for 179. A Brooklyn strike. He'll take it. And look who's coming up. Hunter is going to have his hands full. He's got Annalise O'Brien for the title when we return. You have to let it go. I can't. It's my lucky ball. You don't even bowl anymore. I'll tell you what. Let's sell it on Let Go. We just have to take a picture and post it. Hey, I saw your post. I'll take it. Sold. Yeah. It's time to snap, post, chat, and sell. It's time to let go. Demo.
Nolan bowled so well all day today, I hated to see him lay an egg that last match. But this is a crazy sport, and if you bowl long enough, sooner or later, it'll happen to everyone. But if there's one thing we know about bowling Nolan, it's that he'll be back. Meanwhile, in his first day bowling league in our Roswell Varsity, and one of the first times I can recall that Hunter has made the stepladder finals on Prodigy in a scratch event against the Bigs, he's climbed into the championship match. But boy, has he got his hands full. Annalise O'Brien is the current back-to-back -back junior gold national champion among U15 girls. Now, as his coach, I had a word with Hunter and reminded him that he's perfectly capable of dropping a little 220 or 230 on Annalise and just to bowl his own game and not let her intimidate him. So I think he's as prepared as an 11-year-old can be going up against the best 15-year-old female bowler in the country. This could be really interesting, or it could be a rout. Either way, it'll be a learning experience for Hunter. And you could argue that all the pressure is on Annalise. I mean, for her, it's a contest of, we know you can beat all the best girl bowlers in the country that are your own age, but can you beat a sixth grader? We're about to find out. Hunter sent that one out into the weeds. This isn't like a house shot. You can't send the ball out there expecting it to come back. The one, two, five, nine, you shoot it like a strike, put the ball on what would be the one, three pocket, let the ball drive through and get the five and nine. Well, can't do that. He might just be a little too amped up. He just kind of overthrew that one. Well, you won't see Annalise do anything like that. She won't be overamped. Not after all she's been through, a couple of national TV appearances to win junior gold. She'll be cool. Puts it right in the pocket, leaves a 10. Didn't quite have the drive it needed to snap out the corner pin. She goes to the other rack to grab her spare ball. This is a plastic ball. She'll throw this right over the middle arrow, right at the 10 pin. She never misses these. Automatic. I gotta tell you, I have seen very few kids who are better spare shooters than Annalise. And I think if there's anything I learned from watching the uh, U-17 girls at the GYBT TOC last season when we covered it on Prodigy is the girls might just be better spare shooters than the boys, generally. What? Well, I'm not gonna attribute that to being over-amped. That just got away from her. You never see Annalise throw one like that. The one, two, three, five, nine. This is the same spare Hunter left, but with the three pin. You shoot it just like a strike. But not like she shot at that strike. <laughs> you want it to be in the one, three pocket. That may be just a little overcorrection. That's an open frame, and Hunter gets a reprieve and a two-pin lead. And he crosses over and gets a reverse blower. Not his best shot, but that should calm the nerves at least. Watch this, it's gonna just tick the head pin on the left. Yep, Dylan would have been proud of that strike. Ah, 
Yeah, this time looked like it was going to be a ripper, but the 10 wouldn't go. He got that 5 to blow over into the 7, but the 10 just stood there laughing at him. And it's still laughing. So a couple of unforced errors by Hunter has given Annalise a 10-pin advantage as she gets up in the third frame. And if I could give one piece of advice to Hunter, it would be don't be giving Annalise a lot of openings. She will take advantage of them. But she goes high. Leaves the 6-10. So a bit of a shaky start for both of these players, I must say. But I bet Annalise doesn't have any problem with the 6-10. covers it. So she'll move over to lane 39. And she hasn't really thrown a good shot on that lane yet. First one was wide right. Spare attempt went through the nose. She may still be fishing. And that one doesn't quite get up. When I would take that gesture to her dad to mean, I got this. I think she knows exactly what she did wrong on that shot. Next time she's up on the left lane, you watch. She'll put it right in the pocket, I bet. She covers the 2-4-5. Hunter may have to go get it. I don't think Annalise is going to give him many more openings. Pretty good shot by the little guy. Solid four. Just a pinch high. Now, cover these spares. Got it. That's what he's looking for right there. Looks like he's fishing a little bit, too. He's been going back and forth between bowling balls. I think this is his high road. And that was high flush. All right, Annalise. With a seven pin advantage. And she, too, just a pinch high, leaving a four pin. Seems to be going around on the right lane. She won't have any problem making this. She even knocked down that pin in the pit. Which is optional, by the way. Well, 
Five frames in, Annalise still looking for her first strike. I wouldn't have predicted that. I told you she'd be in the pocket on her next ball on the left lane. I think she's got that one figured out. That was good as soon as it left her hand. And she knew it too. But now look at this. Hunter with a strike up, he can take the lead with another one here. How about that? So Hunter moves out ahead by four with a double. Over about 16 at the arrows, out to about eight at the break point, and 10 in the pit. All right, back on the left lane. Is he using that high road again? I think so. And a little high, but he trips the four. And look at this, Hunter has just extended his lead to 14 against Annalise. Watch his reaction here. You think he's a little charged up? Well, this would be the biggest upset we've had on Prodigy since the long and winding road in October 2017, which was the first time he won a stepladder. He ran through a murderer's row of opponents to climb the stepladder from the bottom to the top. But Annalise says, uh, not so fast. This two-time defending national champion might have something to say about it before it's all over. Watch this. Slaps out the 10. You know you're entering at the perfect angle when you get that hit. She wanted it too. She knew that was a critical shot right there. That cuts the lead down to just four pins. And now Annalise can take the lead back with another strike here in the eighth. when she gets a light shaker to go. Watch the head pin here. The one in the front. It's going to go to the left wall. And then we'll come back and knock out the four, five, and seven. And now watch her reaction to it. Yes. Okay, Hunter, the gauntlet has been thrown down again. Oh, man. Can't throw it much better than that. Stone nine. Just a little high. All right. Make sure you cover this. Oh, man. Well, that's why you use the big ball, right? Okay. Well, he just didn't give that one enough room to the right. And now he's got a problem. The 369. Like the 3610, it's a little easier because you don't have to worry about leaving the 10, but you gotta hit high enough on the three to get the nine without chopping it off the six. And you can't be doing that. Well, he's a better spare shooter than that, but that was an inopportune time for that miss as it hands a 23 pin lead to Annalise. She has just thrown a turkey and by all appearances she seems to have this pair of lanes 
figured out. And she can put an end to Hunter's dream of beating her right here in the ninth and 10th frames. Any questions? You'll never see a more solid strike than that. I think that's the first four bagger we've seen all day on Prodigy. The best hunter can do is 187. Annalise can put that in the rear view mirror right here. See you later. That's the winning ball. Over about 12 at the arrows, out to about eight. And stone solid in the hole. Annalise with a possible 230. A little more speed that time, it looked to me like. So it didn't quite read the back end. Leaves the seven, it does not matter. She will finish with a 219 after a conversion here. There it is, 219. And we see you, Annalise, that was some terrific bowling. And Hunter gives the double thumbs up to the 10 pin, a little facetious gesture there. But you know what? Save for a couple of errant shots, he bowled really well today. And he hung for nine frames with the two-time national champion. He has nothing to hang his head about. But it is Annalise O'Brien who is our winner, just like she was on our season premiere a year ago. We'll visit with her when we return after this. Hey, Prodigy Land. It's me, Coach Randy. You know, last year we began a new push on Prodigy Bowlers Tour to invite you to become a patron of the show. And many of you responded favorably. Thank you. Some of you may still wonder why anyone would want to step up and pay to watch videos on YouTube that are there for anybody to see free of charge. Well, it's a simple concept built around the age-old idea of patronage. I don't get paid a salary to produce these prodigy videos. I do it for the love of the sport of bowling. And under new policies recently announced by YouTube that will affect content creators who create content for children, or whose channels are watched by children, there are some unanswered questions as of right now as to whether even Google AdSense dollars are going to continue flowing to channels like this whose videos feature kids. You know, I spend about 40 hours each week producing Prodigy Bowler's Tour. It is unquestionably a labor of love, but it is a full-time job with very little in the way of a financial reward. I could be spending that time working to build my other business, but I'm so fascinated by the idea of earning a living by being a YouTube content creator that I've sort of gone all in on Prodigy and related activities. A few years ago, a website called Patreon was built for content creators like me to give viewers like you an opportunity to support content creators by becoming a patron of their work and by committing a small amount of money each month to help fund the ongoing creation of the videos you're already enjoying. When we launched our Patreon campaign last year, I originally set it up with three tiers of commitment at $5, $10, and $20 amounts. 
That middle tier would get you exclusive access to content that was produced just for our Prodigy patrons. But honestly, I felt like some of the content produced was good enough that more people ought to be able to enjoy it. Besides, this year I plan to produce additional content, including more Prodigy shorts and short-form content, and I want all Prodigy heads to be able to see it. So I'm pleased to announce that I've eliminated that middle tier, and I'm cutting the price in half for the top tier. So starting right now, you can become a Prodigy patron for a commitment of just $5 a month. That'll give you early access to all our videos. And when I say early access, I mean usually about a day ahead of time when the rest of the world will get to see it. So if the show drops on a Friday, Prodigy patrons will usually get to see it about a day before that. And, effective immediately, I'm cutting in half the price of our premium tier of support from $20 a month to just $10 a month. That's right, for $10 a month, you'll not only get early access to all our content, but you'll also get your name listed in the closing credits on each week's full-length episodes of Prodigy Bowlers Tour. And I'm even giving our Prodigy patrons who commit to that higher tier a promotion. You know, in the world of motion pictures and television, if you're one of the people who put up the money to fund the project, you're not merely the producer, you're the executive producer. So, in keeping with that nomenclature, from now on, Prodigy patrons who commit to the $10 level will be listed as executive producers in the closing credits of our full-length episodes each week. So, there you go. Season 4 Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Now, with a simplified tier system for our Prodigy patrons. The $5 level, which gets you early access to all our shows. And the $10 level, which gets you early access, plus gets your name in the closing credits as an executive producer. By showing your commitment to Prodigy Bowlers Tour with such a tiny commitment as $5 or $10 a month, you help ensure that I can continue investing so much of my time into the creation of the show each week and into developing new forms of content. So thanks to all our Prodigy patrons, and I'd like to invite the rest of you to become a Prodigy patron. Here's how you do it. Sign up at www.patreon.com slash Prodigy Bowlers Tour. That's www.patreon.com patreon.com slash prodigy bowlers tour. I don't know about you, but I feel like we couldn't have asked for a more competitive championship match for our prodigy bowlers tour season four kickoff. The reigning two-time back-to-back junior gold U15 girls national champion Annalise O'Brien gets pushed all the way to the ninth frame by a promising young 11-year-old named Hunter Moffat before Annalise shows us all what a champion is made of. Hunter should be proud of the way he bowled on his first day as a member of the Roswell Varsity League and his first day bowling scratch against the bigs on Prodigy and for hanging tough with such a formidable opponent as Annalise so late in the match. And Annalise showed us once again that a steady diet of precision spare making while patiently waiting for her devastating strike ball to come alive is usually a recipe for success. Annalise kept getting stronger and stronger as the match went along. And now it's time for us to visit with our first champion of the Prodigy Bowlers Tour 2019-20 bowling season. Week one of Prodigy Bowlers Tour season four, and look who's in the winner's circle. It's Annalise O'Brien. And Annalise, I'm sorry to tell you, dear, but the 2019-20 Prodigy coveted trophy pin has not arrived yet. But I have a trophy for you. You can have this one. <laughs> it's her junior gold trophy for winning for the second year in a row. And how cool was that? Very cool. 
So you had to work a little harder for this one, didn't you? Yeah, it was a struggle throughout the week. I had my good days and my bad days, but thankfully I pulled it out. Good Lord helped me through it, so. Of course, it doesn't quite stack up to winning on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, we all know that. But how about Hunter, who hung with you for about nine frames? Yes. So maybe next time uh, we call the episode, Can You Beat an 11-Year-Old? <laughs> and Annalise proved today that she could, so congratulations. Now it's time for a brand new feature. It's the Prodigy Bowlers Tour Tip of the Week. And here's Annalise O'Brien. What's our tip this week, Annalise? Making your spares. What do we need to know about making spares? Well, to me and to a lot of other people, spares are number one. Strikes for show, spares for the gold. I can't tell you how many tournaments I've lost and won by making that one spare or missing it. My dad has always expressed making spares to me since I was young, and it has brought me a lot of fame. What should people do to practice spares? Uh, go to a local bowling alley. Um, some bowling alleys, their systems, they have a mode where you can set specific spares up. But even if you don't have a bowling alley that can set up specific spares, you can practice your sevens and tens on a full rack. Show us. Okay. Oh, he put my ball away. Oh, got our bowling ball put away. Dad, Daddy, I need my spare ball. Annalise's dad, Doug O'Brien, is also her coach. Doug is a star on the PBA 50 tour and is also a USBC silver certified coach. He instilled in her this healthy obsession with making spares. See, perfect shot. Okay, so you're going to shoot what? A 10 pin? A 10 pin. Okay, so what do you do to set up? Well, where I stand is 35 for my 10 pin. Cause She's going to stand on this last dot on the far left. And you don't have to stand there specifically. I stand there because the middle arrow lines up with the 10 pin. So wherever the middle arrow lines up for you is where you need to stand. Okay. Like money in the bank. And that's how you become a two-time defending national champion. Keep the ball on the lane, which for me is really hard to do. You know, I threw five gutter balls today. Five, one in league, and then four after. I think two in Prodigy. Woo woo. Um, and then... When it's your turn... Make sure not to get three, because if you do, you're out. And that's really hard for me to do, I guess, because you know... Woo <laughs> woo!